We, um, uh, maybe this is your first time here and you're like, man, I have no idea what's going on. What, what, what is this guy talking about stewardship? We, we've been talking about this for the past three weeks. This is the last week of my little stewardship sermon series. And, um, you know, when you think about it, um, I, my, really my prayer is that through this whole little sermon series, God has shown you more of how he desires for you to think about generosity and giving and stewardship, but also ownership, which is some of what we talked about last week. And, you know, I think most of us are on the same page as we've been in this sermon series. Like, we all want to be generous. Like, we want, we want to give. And so I think the thing I've tried to say over and over again each week is in order for each of us to be in that place, to be generous, you have to understand what God says about being a good steward. So uh, today is going to be a little bit different. Uh, you know, normally when a sermon, uh, a pastor preaches a sermon, there may be like three points in a poem. You know, that's the old saying. I'm not a real poetry guy. But oftentimes I'll give you three points. The good news is for you today, I have 10 points. Yeah, I feel like I can get this done in about two and a half hours, okay? So, and I'm joking, okay? I, I had a timer on the front row in the last service, I kid you not. But uh, here's, what I, here's why I have 10 points. Um, most of you are familiar with the Ten Commandments, am I right? You better be, okay? Okay, so w- what I'm going to do with you today, and this is, not, this is not Kent's original thing, I've talked to you about, I've, been, I've read this book uh, called Beyond Blessed. It's a whole book about stewardship written by a pastor named Robert Morris. And what he did in the book, he basically said, you know what, based on God's Ten Commandments, he, he said, there are really 10 financial commandments that are really grounded in some of that scripture. So I, I borrowed these from him. I, I wish I would say I'm, I'm just creative enough to come up with all this on my own. I, I'm not. But that's what I'm going to do. That's why we have 10 points today. So if you're like a note taker, you're going to love this because just right now you can go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and you can, you can do this. So here we go. What is the first financial commandment? It lines up with the first real commandment. Put God first. Put God first. We, we know the Bible, has. we've talked about it, teaches us to tithe. We know the Bible teaches us to give of our first fruits. But look how this lines up with the first commandment God gave to Moses. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. Put God first. And so this is what God says, put me first. Now, I mentioned a moment ago, we're, we're kind of all at different places in this journey. No doubt, some of you in this room today, or maybe you're watching online, you would be the person who would say, Kent, man, I, I hear this. I know the Bible says put me first, especially with, with financial things in my life. But your testimony could be, bro, my life is a financial wreck right now like the wheels are falling off that may be where you're at that's very real in fact I would be shocked if there weren't multiple people in this room who would say that's where I'm at good news the Bible gives us clear examples of people in that same kind of situation let me just share one with you briefly as we walk through these this morning in the book of first Kings chapter 17 This is where God sends Elijah to visit a widow. Just read this with me. This is 1 Kings chapter 17, beginning in verse 10. And so the Bible says, Elijah arose and he went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, there was a widow there that was gathering some sticks. And he called to her and said, bring me a little water in a vessel that I might drink. And as she was going to get it, he he called her again. He said, bring bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. Look what she said. Look at her response. As the Lord your God lives, sir. (laughs) Look what she says. I have nothing. I have nothing baked. I have only a handful of flour in this jar and a, a little bit of oil in a jug. And she said to him, what I'm doing right now, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and for my son so that we may eat it and then we're going to die. And Elijah said to her, do not fear. Do not fear. Go ahead, go and do as you have said, but 
first, I would say there's a principle here of the first fruits, but first, make a little cake, bring it to me, and afterward make something for yourself and for your son. For, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent. In other words, it's not going to run out. And the jug of oil shall not become empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And so the Bible says she went and she did, as Elijah said, and she and he and her household, they did not die, but they ate for many days. So put it into perspective. Here's a widow. And, and she is saying, my son and I are in such a dire predicament. We are about to die. All we have is a little bit of flour, a little bit of oil. She's out trying to find a few sticks of firewood to, to bake something to eat. And in her heart, she is saying, like, this is it. This, this is the end. After we partake of this, we will die. My point being, like, this is as bad as it gets. So here, here's the lesson. In the widow's distress... She made a decision, think about it, to put God first. She chooses to be a blessing. She chooses to be generous with what little she had left. And in that moment, we see a miraculous provision from the Lord. God, think about it. Some people, I think, may get this upside down. God sent Elijah to her not so that his need could be met, but God sent Elijah to this widow so that God could provide for her. You, you think about what plays out in many churches today. A lot of people would say this. People think that God wants us to tithe to the church. Why? So that the church can be taken care of. But, but I would say no. God wants you to tithe so that you could be taken care of. Remember this. I've said it before. God doesn't need your money. you got to remember, it's already his anyway. And so here's this widow who's only got one meal left. When she puts God first, God provides for her, for her son, for Elijah, and the oil and the, the, the the flour in the jars does not run out. So financial commandment, number one, put God first. Financial commandment, number two, don't worship material things. Well, what does that line up with? Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. And you shall not make for yourself a carved image or a graven image, or, or basically this is talking about idols. This is idol worship. Don't worship material things. And like all of us are tempted here. We, we are tempted to worship man's creations, even idolizing material things. Let me ask you a couple questions just to put this into perspective for you. Have you ever found yourself putting any kind of material thing before God? I would say most of us would say yes. What about this one? Have you ever bought something that you later regretted buying. Y'all, is, is anybody awake? <laughs> like, like, at least in the 930 service on that, everybody in the room was like, mm-hmm. Can I get a mm-hmm? <laughs> Did you mean it? No. <laughs> Some of you. Um, you know, you, you see it, and it's pretty. It's all shiny. Oh, man, I, w I want that. If I buy that, that's like going to change my life. Um, some of you don't even know this. I, I would guess it was about 15 years ago. I, I went through this, uh, this type of season when I decided I really needed, oh, a motorcycle. <laughs> oh, yes. Somebody said, oh, no. I say, oh, yes. Yes, I did. And uh, it's, by the way, if you own a motorcycle, that's fine. I'm, I'm not, that's fine. But, but my journey was that I go out and buy this motorcycle in a season that things were still financially upside down in my world. Terrible decision, but it was shiny. 
and it sounded cool. And maybe, maybe I was kind of like, you know, I'd turned 40 recently, and it's like, oh, the whole midlife, what am I going to do? I need a motorcycle. Ride to live? Live to ride. <laughs> Whatever. Well, the, the, what ends up happening with that little, that little incident, about a year into me having a motorcycle, I, it was just completely obvious. Here, You know, I got the IRS saying, hey, bro, you still owe us money. So I sold the motorcycle and gave that money to the good old IRS. But good stewardship, here's, here's my point on this. Good stewardship means that you pray first before you make any kind of major purchase. You talk to God about it. I hadn't talked to God about that. Why? Because we, we need to talk to the owner first. Financial commandment number three. Don't use God's name selfishly. Look what Exodus chapter 20 verse 7 says. And you shall not take the name of your Lord God in vain. When I think about a vain person, think with me about a vain person. There's some characteristics there. I would say oftentimes that person is conceited. They're full of pride. Maybe a little narcissistic. Self-centered. All these things are playing out. So when it comes to being a good steward... It is not right to use God's name in a selfish way. Here's an example. I just talked about the motorcycle. Selfishly asking for something materialistic in God's name, my prayer would have been, Dear Lord, in the name of Jesus, I am asking you to to just give me a motorcycle. God, I know it's not a need, but I really want it. And it's really pretty. And I'm having a midlife crisis, Lord. So in Jesus' name, please provide. That's what I'm talking about. That's how you pray the wrong way. Instead of your prayer being focused on on materialistic things, you would focus on the kingdom, being kingdom-focused in your prayers, praying about spiritual things. Now, I am not saying that you can't talk to the Lord about your needs because Jesus himself, when he gave us the Lord's Prayer, we know what it says, God... Give us this day our daily bread. God, give us this day my daily motorcycle. No, it doesn't say that. So the real challenge is that in my prayers and your prayers, we don't want to be conceited in those prayers, self-seeking. We don't want to be materialistic, using God's name selfishly. Financial commandment number four, and this is kind of a no-brainer. Be a good steward. No problem. That happens every week. Don't, don't worry about it you got to love the invention of the metal jug thing, right? <laughs> Be a good steward. It completely lines up with, with what we've been talking about. The, this is the fourth week now. Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 10. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now think about this. Be a good steward. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work. But on the seventh day, it is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. So being a good steward, I've I've been talking about this, it's not only about money, it involves your time. Yes, your talents, yes, your treasure, but your time and your energy are a piece of this as well. When you practice a day of Sabbath, when you take a day of rest, you are are basically acknowledging God. I, I confess, you can do more in six days than I can do myself in my own strength in seven. That's what the Sabbath's about. You may have heard that same principle applied to the tithe. Tithing is believing, God, you can do more with 90% than than I can do on my own with 100%. And so for people who are good stewards, I promise you, if you begin to think about the people God's put around you, maybe you're this person. People who are good stewards, there are these characteristics you'll see in all of them. Number one, they all spend wisely. They're just wise with their money. They spend wisely. Number two, they save diligently. They're thinking about that. They spend wisely. They save diligently. And number three, this is the biggie, they, they give generously. That's what a good steward does. The fifth financial commitment, commitment commandment is this. This is, this is big. I want you to really focus in. God desires for us to teach our children 
what he says about money. The parallel commandment is obvious. Exodus chapter 20, verse 10. Scripture says that, children, you are to honor your father and your mother. Now, think about this with me. All of our kids, they learn about God. They're learning about money from us. We're the parents. Some of you are grandparents like me. I, like, to show you how much they're listening, this happened in my household yesterday morning. Shiloh and Judah and Noah were over. It's nap time. Praise the Lord. I love nap time. Gives me a reason to take a nap, right? And so it's time for Judah to lay down. I was going to go in there and lay with him. Shauna was putting Noah to sleep. And I don't know, I said something in response to the kids that was like, well, good Lord. I don't, I don't even know. Or, oh, my Lord. Or what, You remember the phrase I used? Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Okay. So that's what I said. And immediately, with I kid you not, within three seconds, four-year-old Judah says, Oh, Lord. <laughs> and I'm like, what? it was so weird hearing that come from a child, a four-year-old. Y'all, our children are listening. So, so God commands us to honor our parents because in that relationship, that, that is the, the foundation for where all of discipleship really begins. And so as a parent, as a grandparent, I'm wanting to say to you, you've got to think about the words you're saying that, that your kids hear. If I, you pick any phrase, if, if your children overhear you saying something like this, man, we just need more money. Like if they, if they hear that conversation playing out, if they hear you saying, good grief, our problems would all be solved if we just had more money. I, I want you to think about what you're communicating to your kids. You're, you're actually teaching your children to serve money. Remember what Jesus said in Luke 17. No one, no servant can serve two masters. For he will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Why? Because you cannot serve both God and money. So our kids are listening. They're listening to everything we say. And so God desires for us to teach them what he says to us about money. Number six, boy, you're going to love this one. Round of applause. Live on a budget. Live on a budget, right? Um, here, now, th this is, you're about to crack up when I share the, the verse that Robert Morris suggested we use on this one. And he said, he said for him, this was a bit of a stretch. Live on a budget. Here's the verse, Exodus 20, 13. You shall not murder. I, I read this, I'm like, what in the world is this dude talking about? And, and, and he admits, he's like, I know, I know, I know. And so kind of in a joking way, what he said was this. If you're not living on a budget, it's kind of like you're killing yourself. Yeah, okay, whatever. Here, here's the point. Um, before I entered into uh, the ministry, I had a career in advertising. And man, I thought I was large and in charge. You know, I, I had the world figured out. And I had this sales manager, very focused guy, who would, you know, he would want to ride with you in your territory. And, you know, he was always giving you these little snippets. Many of you have heard of this one. His favorite one to say would be this. Kent, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. You know, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I've only heard you say that 7,000 times. But, but think about this related to a budget. Like, because that's all a budget really is. It's a plan. A budget is simply a plan. And I wonder, do you, have, do you have a plan in place? Do you have something on paper? Do you really have a budget? You know, when I, when I go through this assessment with couples who are getting married, there's a whole section on money and finances and stewardship. And, of course, the assessment asks both. They take this online thing. It's so cool separately, and then it merges the info together. But almost everybody says, yeah, 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 we've got a budget. We've got a budget. You know, they take the test separately. But then it follows up to say to the couple, how many of you are actually following the budget? 
And, and about 80% of the time, they're like, uh, yeah, we're, we're not doing that. Got it on paper, but hey, you know. And so I want to, you know, if we can't laugh and have some fun with budget, budgeting, I mean, what are we going to do here? I wanna, I'm, a, I'm inviting you in your household to begin to have some fun with budgeting. And so let's just say, I'm going to make up a scenario. I'm sure this would never play out in my household. But let's just say that you are married, and let's say that you have a, a wife who might be scrolling through Instagram stories, and there are certain influencers who are telling her, this is the greatest thing ever known to mankind. And, and you need this in your household, or it's beautiful in your household, and here's where you can get it at a discounted price today only for the next three hours. Um, and so that might play out in some households. I don't, I don't know. Uh, but I want to introduce you to a character you can use in, in this situation in your house, a, a guy named Mr. Budget. Mr. Budget. Mr. Budget can be a part of your family if you like. And so here's what this might look like. The next time your wife says to you, hey, hey, honey, like, man, this is something I really want to buy. What do you think? And, and you know it's not a part of your written budget. Here's what you can say to your spouse. Honey, honey, you know, I would absolutely love to buy that for you today. But how about this? Let's ask Mr. Budget and see what he says. And you kind of pause for a minute, and, and, and here's your next response. Oh, oh, Mr. Budget says no. <laughs> now, you need to know, guys, once you introduce Mr. Budget into your household, you will most likely hear that same response from your wife when you want to buy a motorcycle. <laughs> oh, can't. Mr. Budget says no. <laughs> but I promise you, living on a budget, well, it'll radically transform your life, your household. I, I realize this. I get it. Some of you right now, you would think, uh, you think, Kent, the struggle is real. Like, this is your struggle. And you're a bit embarrassed because you're like, I don't know what to do. I've never been good at numbers. And so here's the cool thing. Here's what I'm inviting you to do. Without me even enlisting people, do you know that over the years, God has brought people to Hope Fellowship Church who are really incredibly great with budgets? And they have come to me and said, here's the deal, Kent. If there's anybody ever in our church that just wants some help, they say, I will volunteer my time. I will meet with them privately. I'll help them put this together on paper. And just start taking some steps in that direction. Like confidential and free. There are people in our church who, who are willing to do that. They're not going to shame you. They're not going to embarrass you. Because they just want to help you. Here's the key. That won't happen until you take the first step. Ball's in your court. Well, what's the first step? You've got to ask for help. You just do. You've got to ask for help. And so what I'm inviting you to do this week, call the church office, email us, text us. In, in the church app on the directory, all of our stuff's there. Phone numbers, the whole thing. And just say, hey, what you're talking about Sunday, I would love to be partnered up with somebody that could maybe sit down and talk to me about, about this. And, and we will help facilitate that to happen now super cool um you know i i i'm privileged to see real life happen right and and what i've seen god do w with families in our church being faithful and budgeting is is mind-blowing like i think i especially just i love i love to see god at work but there's something so special when like there's a young family who steps into all of this it is so amazing and so really, I think, I think a lot of this started a little over three years ago when we were still meeting at the school, and we did another stewardship sermon series called The Blessed Life. And, and literally out of that series, there were, there were several key, like younger couples, younger families in our church who just were like, all right, Lord, I see what your word says. I'm going to trust you in this. And, and many of them have, have stepped into this for God's glory. 
Like, I, I won't give him away. If he wants to show you one day, he can show you. There, there's actually a, a, a guy in our church who God worked in his life in such a way through all of this. He took the, the key scripture passage from that sermon series, and he has a, a full-color tattoo on his arm because it, it impacted his life so much about learning to live a generous life the way God calls us to live. It's just incredible to see what the Lord is doing. Financial commandment number seven, live below your means. Ooh, okay. Live below your means. Here's the parallel verse. Check it out. It will make sense in about 30 seconds. Exodus 20, 14. And you shall not commit adultery. Think about this. If you were to commit adultery, it means that you are living outside of or above God's means for your life. And so with money, like for most all of us, the real challenge is this. Living below our means can sometimes be a struggle. And I would say there are a couple of reasons that is a struggle for so many people. They don't want to live above their means. Number one, here it is, because they're just not content. It may be that you find yourself just never satisfied, always looking for the next best thing. You, you continually, you're like, why did I do that? You, you buy things you really cannot afford. And I'm, I'm just going to say this to you. Like, when you live that way, it's almost as if you are shaking your fist in the face of Almighty God and saying to Him, God, I'm, I'm not content with you. Lord, I am not content with the way you are providing for me because you're basically saying to the Lord, God, I, I'm, I'm just going to do it my way. I'm just going to do it my way. And, and then you compare that mindset to what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 4. Look at this. He says to the church, Oh, church, man, here's what I've learned. He says, I've learned that in whatever situation I'm in, I've, I've got to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. He says, in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty, but also facing hunger, of facing abundance, but also facing need. And then he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I don't know if you just saw, Paul said twice in that passage, here's what he says, I have learned. Which says to me, he didn't always get it, did he? The good news for you, the good news for me is, we can learn how to live with contentment based on what God wants for our life. You, you really can live within your means. Why do people struggle to live Below their means, number one, they're just not content. Truth number two, the, another reason people don't do this is they just don't like to count. Yes, I said count. How many of you are, are uh, really into math? You just love it, right? Hmm. Hey, look at Luke chapter 4. A few of you do. That's, God bless you. I need you in my life, okay? Look at Luke 14, 28. For which of you, desiring to build a tower does not first sit down, there it is, and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. So, so I just kind of gave it away. I want to see, I just want to see you. Like, I struggled with math all through school. Are there any, are there any brothers and sisters who would say, Kent, you are my people? I, I, yes. All right, see, it's usually about half the room. God bless every one of you. <laughs> and if that's you, you probably, like me, were saying to yourself for many years, I will never use this stuff, right? And then all of a sudden you grow up and you realize, well, actually, some of this was kind of important for me to learn. That, that's real. Notice I didn't say all of it, <laughs> but I'm that guy, right? Um, if, if, you're, if you're, maybe this is a part uh, of life that you struggle with, if if you don't like math, if you don't like to count, it may be that, you know, when payday comes around, um, you know, with online banking, you, you see that money. It's like, bam, it's there. You know, you wake up at like 12.01 a.m. Is it there? <laughs> Is it there? And so you look at your bank account. Maybe you're like this, and you think, oh, finally. Like, I, I feel so wealthy today. 
and you say to yourself, today, this is the day I've been waiting for. I can now spend, spend, spend. But I would warn you, if you're not count, count, counting, when the bills come due, you're going to say to yourself, I am now broke, broke, broke. Good stewardship means you learn to live within your means. The eighth financial commandment, don't buy now and pay later. Don't do it. Don't buy now and pay later. Exodus 20, 15 says, you shall not steal. You shall not steal. I would say when, you, when you're buying things now, paying for them later, it's, it's like you're stealing from God. And, and think about this with me. Not only are you, you're really robbing yourself of financial freedom, but you're also robbing yourself of the hope that God really wants for you to live with. Look with me. Here's what I'm talking about. Romans chapter 8, verse 24. God created you to have hope. Look at the text. New hope, I'm sorry, now hope that is seen is not really hope at all, Paul says. For who hopes... For what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we learn something. We, we wait for it with patience. So God, no doubt, created each one of us to be able to work for and to wait for and to long for something, to have hope. But in our culture today, everybody and their grandmother says, no, you want something? Just go and buy it right now. Don't wait. Order it. Charge it. It'll be on your doorstep tomorrow. And, and honestly, it, how much lasting joy is in that process? I would say this. It is very possible that sometimes instead of joy, when you do the knee-jerk purchase, there are times that that will bring grief into your life. Do you realize these are the most current statistics? Data shows us that 8 out of 10 Americans in our nation today are in debt. That would mean that 80% of us in this room are in debt. This buy now, pay later plan it is just not a great idea. Uh, here's my example. How many of you have been to the glamorous, beautiful, gigantic furniture store with the massive showroom? And you're like, wow, this furniture looks amazing. And then the salesperson tells you, well, good news, sir. Today, you can, you can buy that, and you have five years to pay for that interest-free. And you're like, wow, this is amazing. And then, so you do it. You pull the trigger, and you get that couch now in your living room, and you look at that couch like one year in. And you're like, I don't even like that couch anymore. <laughs> that, guy, that guy is ugly. Why did I buy that couch? And then you realize, oh, hey, I've got four more years of payments on that couch I hate when I really just want to take it to Goodwill. That to show you how real this is, this, this is crazy. Every Sunday morning, I go through my sermon back here one last time, and I had my computer open. My, my email was up. I'm reading through the notes. I, within 15 to 30 seconds of me being at this point in the sermon, talking about the furniture store, do you know the, the email that pops up? My good friends at Rooms to Go. Just telling me about the most amazing deal they have for me, not only today, but like every day of my life. God's plan for stewardship is better. Number nine, be a good witness. Exodus 20, verse 16 says, You shall not bear a false witness against your neighbor. So instead of being a false witness, think about this. God's plan is for you and I to be, be a good witness, a true witness to our neighbor. Just apply that to your literal and next door neighbors for just a, a minute. And, and there's, a, there's a high probability, like if you've made out your Oikos list and you're praying for the 8 to 15 people close to you, like your neighbor's name could actually be on this list. But what if? What if that same neighbor is looking over at you and he's like, man, what is up with my neighbor Kent? Can the guy not be a good enough steward to get out and mow the lawn? Can, can the guy not, you know that fence back there? That has been falling down, broken up for like four years. 
And your neighbor might be thinking, like, what kind of a steward is this dude? And then maybe he sees you, like, pull up into your own driveway, and, oh, look, he bought a boat. Oh, look, he bought a four-wheeler. Oh, look, he bought a new shiny car. Like, I, I don't know. Is that what your neighbor might see in you? Are you being a good steward? Are you being a good witness or bad witness? Are you modeling stewardship even, even in your own community? Finally, number 10, be content. Be content. No, nobody will be shocked by the commandment that lines up with this. Exodus 20, verse 17, you shall not covet. You shall not covet. When you and I are truly content, you know what I've noticed? We don't really covet. Now, Exodus 20, verse 17 goes on to say, you shall not covet. Then it says, don't covet your neighbor's house. Don't covet your neighbor's wife. Don't covet your neighbor's ox. Don't covet your neighbor's donkey. Basically, don't covet anything that is your neighbor's. And I know you're like, oh, ha, ha. we don't have, you know, donkeys and oxes, but we got stuff, don't we? We got stuff. Look at what Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 says. This may surprise you when it comes to covet, covetousness. Put to death, look, look, put to death. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly inside of you. He does a whole list. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. It's idolatry. To covet, it's idolatry. Why? Because on account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. So you think about this with me. When, like, if there's a temptation inside of you to covet what your neighbor has, you, I, think, I think you will agree. You are essentially making your neighbor a god, an idol. And, and here's what can play out. When you covet, perhaps you're, you're no longer looking to get a, a new car on God's timetable when God, you've been talking to the Lord about it, when God tells you it's time, but instead you buy the car when your neighbor tells you to. The keeping up with the Joneses thing. You're not paying attention to what God tells you to do. You're just actually allowing your neighbor to tell you what to do. It's very possible. And, and I would just say this. Don't ever let someone who is not living out what God's word teaches about stewardship influence you in the way you spend money, the money that God has entrusted to you in any way at all that contradicts Scripture. Don't covet don't be content. I, I want you to, there's so much here. And I told, I don't know. I told the first service, I tried to time out my sermons. Evidently, I did a terrible job this week because I'm a little over on time. And I've got like five more stories I can share that I won't. But my heart's desire, as I said at the beginning of, of our time together today, is that through Scripture, that, that God would begin to work in your life to allow him to show you through his word the blessing of stewardship, of generosity, of giving, of being a good steward. The most important thing I said on week one, and I'll say as we close out today, when you think about giving, is what John 3.16 said. For God so loved the world that he gave. God loves you just as you are unconditionally and he loves you so much that he gave his son Jesus who went to the cross. He was perfect. He was sinless. He gave his life. He shed his blood so that you might be made new, forgiven of sin, redeemed by the lamb. And so, man, as you're thinking about God, what are you leading me to? Many of you in this room are mature believers. Some of you are new in this journey. The most important thing I want you to hear to say I want you to hear me say today is if you don't know Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, I'm inviting you to follow him today, to trust him. Well, Kent, how do I do that? Just like I encouraged you to call the church, email us, 
the balls in your court to say, hey, I need to talk to somebody about this the very same way. And so you have a chance to respond right now today. In a moment, we're going to stand together. We're going to sing. We are available to pray with you, to talk to you, no matter what's going on in your life. We invite you today to respond to the Lord. So pray with me right now, if you would. God, today, in this very moment, we acknowledge that you have shown us so much about stewardship and generosity. God, we acknowledge today that uh, one of the most significant verses in the whole Bible is when you remind us, God, that you loved us so much that you gave your son, Jesus. God, I know we're thinking about getting out of here and going to lunch. But Lord, I, I do not want anyone to be distracted by the reality that in this very moment, Lord, you're at work. You've been at work leading up to this moment, and you're drawing men and women in this room to surrender their life to you. And so, God, my prayer now is that each individual, would, they would not listen to the distraction of the adversary. They would not go into, like, the list of excuses to make. But, God, simply that they would surrender to you with childlike faith. Say, Lord, here I am. I'm trusting you. I'm ready to follow you. Forgive me my sin. Make me new. Lord, we need you. We need you. So work in us, change us, refine us, make us more like you with everything. With everything. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.